Hello, good afternoon. I am truly delighted to welcome Kate Briggs today. She has flown in from Paris uh, to participate in the prestigious Inside Out lecture series at Leeds Beckett University. Dr. Briggs is translator of Roland Barthes, The Preparation of the Novel. I always think it's good to wave books. And How to Live Together, both published by Columbia University Press and which respectively represent his first and last series of lectures at the Collège de France. She is also the co-translator of Michel Foucault's Introduction to Kant's Anthropology, published by MIT and Semiotext. She has publicised Exercise in Pathetic Criticism and the beautiful Nabokov paper, both with information as material. <laughs> York, UK. And the chat book on reading as an alternation of flights and perchings with no press in Calgary, Calgary Canada. She currently teaches at the Piet Svart Institute in Rotterdam, where she is a core tutor for writing. Vladimir Nabokov used to say to his students as they were about to sit their exams, pen, ink, think. I'm certain that Kate Briggs' talk today will challenge our thinking about what writing is and what it can possibly be. <laughs> Yesterday, she told me she had been in her hotel room reading through her talk in preparation for her presentation to you today and didn't know if it actually made any sense. <laughs> She felt like she could hardly understand what she had written, let alone communicate it to anybody else. I like this idea. <laughs> In the UK, for doctoral study, we have this ridiculous phrase, you have to make an original contribution to knowledge. As a colleague of mine wittily pointed out, if your work was truly original, it would be hard to find anyone to examine it, let alone recognise it. Well, in Switzerland, they have the European Graduate School, a super doctoral program where amazing intellectuals such as Chris Krauss, Slavoj Zizek, and Sylvain Lotringer teach. Their defining phrase for a doctoral award is, you must be working at the limits of your own understanding. So that's where I think we will be today, with Kate pushing at the edge of what it's possible to comprehend. And I think that's a really perfect place to be. As Gilbert and George said in their Ten Commandments for Art, Thou shalt not know exactly what thou dost, but thou shalt do it. Please join me in extending a very warm Yorkshire welcome to the one and only Kate Briggs. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm really delighted to be here. That was a really extraordinary introduction. I don't know how anyone could really follow that introduction, but um, yeah. I was conscious when I was practicing in my hotel room about the second part of this lecture, which will be more of a uh, reading rather than a talk. <laughs> um, uh, about yeah, whether I was actually um, managing to engage, whether I would manage to engage you, whether I'd manage to hold your attention. The reading part, well, it's the first time that I'll be publicly reading from um, this section of a book in progress, so I'm interested to, to test that with you, um, to see if I can hold your attention and um, to see if I can make you follow me. Um, but the first part is more of a talk, although with all my talks they're composed, so I'm not going to be ad-libbing, it makes me too nervous to ad-lib, so this is prepared. Um, to start with lush, adjective, of vegetation, especially grass, growing vigorously, lavishly productive, characterized by abundance, appealing to the senses, opulent, sumptuous. When I was a teenager in the early 1990s, growing up in a small town in Somerset, if me and my friends liked something, if we thought something or someone was good or attractive or maybe beautiful, or compelling, or meaningful, and for these reasons, kind of worthy of our interest, we would say, it or he, she is lush. Rare, adjective, of an event or situation not occurring very often, coming far apart in time, or thinly distributed over an area, as in few and far between. Not compacted, not dense. Also, unusual, as in unusually great, unusually excellent, admirable, as in she displayed a rare talent. 
When I was a teenager in the early 1990s, growing up in a small town in Somerset, if we didn't like something, if we thought something or someone was bad or unattractive or ugly or stupid or <coughs> worthy of our interest, but precisely for these negative reasons, we would say, and this seems quite extraordinary to me now, now I look it up in the dictionary, um, that he or it or she is rare. I don't know if that brings any bells for anyone else in this room, but in, in Somerset, that's what we said. So between the ages of 16 and about, well, 11 and about 16, these were my aesthetic categories. The two most powerful and articulate and economical ways among my peer group of expressing a felt judgment and in the process of forging alliances, positioning myself, becoming myself. Now I work in an art school and I've been thinking about the terms and the categories, the judgments, the felt judgments that I and my colleagues use to talk about our students. I hear us and I hear myself say, for example, convincing. Adjective, meaning persuading or assuring by argument or evidence, appearing worthy of belief, plausible. Note the appearing here. To say something is convincing is not quite the same as saying, I believe it or I believe in it. It appeals, appears worthy of my belief, um, but I'm leaving the door open for the possibility that it may turn out not to be. I hear us say, yeah, that's convincing. Or sometimes the opposite, yeah, I'm, that's unconvincing. I'm unconvinced. Adjective, failing to make me believe that something is true or real or valid, or more generally, failing to impress. I hear us talk about coherence, as in, ah, yeah, that's a coherent body of work, or that's a coherent position. Coherent, adjective, logical, consistent, also forming a unified whole, which is interesting. That should be something we admire or look for. I have a friend who works in a different art school and he tells me that often he hears one colleague of his in particular talk about whether or not a student's work is robust, adjective, of an object, sturdy in its construction, resilient, hardy, well-made, or of a wine or food, strong and rich in flavour or smell. But when this friend was growing up in Dublin as a teenager, when he and his friends really liked something, when they really liked it a lot, they would say, that it was deadly, deadly, adjective, <coughs> tending or liable to cause death, fatal, lethal, or the definition I found in my kind of rooting through the dictionaries that I like the most, being like death, of death. Also boring, as in the lecture was deadly. Also excessive, inordinate. Also extremely <coughs> accurate, as in Annie Oakley was a deadly shot. Convincing, coherent, robust, but of course the word I hear and I find myself using the most often in relation not only to students' work, but also to the books I read and the art I look at, or even the telly I watch, and I guess this would probably be true for you too, but I hope we can talk about it later, is interesting. As in, I like your work. It's really interesting. Interesting. Adjective. Arousing a feeling of interest, holding, if only provisionally, the attention or curiosity. Shen uh, Nagai, in her book, Our Aesthetic Categories, published in 2012, looks at everyday acts of aesthetic judgment, focusing especially on the cute, the zany, and the interesting. Now, I never and have never used the word zany to describe cultural objects or experiences, and only very rarely use the word cute. And I think this shows it's, you know, Shen Nagai's American, this shows up the degree to which these categories are um, and they speak to our locatedness in time and space. So lush, rare, they were particular to me in Froome, Somerset. Um, zany, cute, they have their own kind of cultural, geographical, historical, social specificity. But I am wholly convinced by, and I kind of see cause to believe in, her really fantastic discussion of the interesting as a ubiqu ubiquitous, a kind of everywhere, and therefore also pres so presumably necessary but also kind of under-analyzed aesthetic category. We say things are interesting all the time, but what do we mean when we say something is interesting? She points, for example, to the way it operates as the minimal, probably the least obtrusive, and perhaps also the least committed claim of value possible for the cultural object being commented on, and how it ascribes value to that which appears to differ in an as-yet-to-be-conceptualized way from a general expectation or norm. 
but where the sense of that non itself, as well as the manner of the differing, is not yet understood. So, in other words, I'm interested in your work when I sense that it's emerging, this work, from and setting itself apart from the background of a kind of general, normal, familiar background of stuff and activity in some way, but I'm not yet in a position to tell you how or indeed whether that background, what, what that background is, or even what the qualities of the thing setting itself apart are. I'm just kind of saying it's interesting, I'm saying it's emerging, but I don't know how, I haven't, and I'm not re yet ready to conceptualise or to tell you how I'm understanding it, because that would be a bit, bit more committed in my judgement. In terms of the feeling of being interested, and I think this is really uh, acute, Nagay argues that it always seems to be underpinned by really quite a calm, but not necessarily weak, affective intensity. So finding something interesting has a kind of steady ongoingness to it. It's not like the sudden shock of delight or pleasure or disgust or captivation even. It has a kind of averaging effect, a sort of neutrality. So in this way, it's not unrelated to the boring. I'd like to point you to this book because it's a really great book and indeed if any of this sounds interesting so you can follow her discussion further. Um, but my purpose today is not really to kind of bemoan the apparent poverty um, of our current aesthetic categories. Um, although there is a bit of that, I think, you know, the categories I hear at you and use at work most often, and I did make a small inventory of this. I'd be interested to hear your own inventories of the categories you use or hear um, in, in relation to your work. Um, they seem to me to be a bit less committed in their judgments, a bit more cagey, um, and definitely more cerebral and less kind of bodily than lush, saying something is lush, or saying something is rare, which is a really strange category, or even deadly, you know, deadly. Um, but what I like so much about this book is how, in a general manner, it invites us to pay attention to our everyday aesthetic categories, um, the ones we use all the time given that we're not normally talking about the beautiful, the sublime, um, what are the ones that we use all the time to make these complex value judgments, to attend to their complexity, and to try to work out what actually we mean by them, and what kind of work we're asking them to do for us? Which brings me to the term experimental, especially the term experimental as it's used in relation to writing. And I hear it used quite a lot, in book reviews, or on the internet, in Twitter accounts, in self-descriptions of writers, I'm an experimental writer, in conversations with friends and colleagues about some and students about some story I've read or a poem I've read. Um, I've used it myself. When I first met uh, Simon Morris and Nick Thurston of Information as Material, it was in the context of their writing residency at the Whitechapel uh, back in 2011, and they'd invited me to come along and help animate a summer school and we were all using the term experimental. We were talking about experimental writing, experimental reading, experimental criticism. But what exactly were we talking about? I wonder now. Um, what did we want the term to mean? Experimental as pertaining to method, to the manner of, of writing and working, the mode of the writing's production, or experimental as a quality of the writing itself, or as naming the aesthetic experience that the writing produces in its readers or promises to produce or aspires to produce. And if it was that, that kind of third option, then what would be the features of that experience? To think about this some more, I looked to Routledge's recently published <coughs> Companion to Experimental Literature, and there I'm told that throughout the volume, this collection of essays, the term experimental will be generally be used more or less interchangeably with avant-garde or innovative. I find in there a quote from B.S. Johnson, often described as an experimental novelist, poet, critic, and filmmaker, perhaps most famous, famous for his work, The Unfortunates, published in 1969, his book In a Box. And he professes not to like the term experimental because, he says, I'm quoting, experimental for most reviewers is almost, almost a synonym for unsuccessful. I object to the word experimental being applied to my work. Certainly, I make experiments, but the unsuccessful ones are quietly hidden away, and what I choose to publish is, in my terms, successful. It, that is, it has been the best way I could find of solving my particular writing problems. It's true, I think, that we align the experimental with something like difficulty, which can be difficult even if we like difficulty, because difficulty can be exclusive and it can be off-putting um, and only for the initiated. It also suggests or 
the possibility of the, or the, the, the exclusion or deferral of something like pleasure. Um, for Christine Brooke Rose, another 20th century British so-called experimental writer, calling her aesthetic experimental was for her a critic's way of marginalizing her work, <coughs> of admiring but not actually reading it. We might be interested in admiring rather than reading, but I think this is interesting. And this is, for her, was one of the reasons why she didn't sell any books or hardly any books. There's an argument which would say what would nowadays we recognize and readily name as contemporary experimental writing is, in fact, almost always a kind of homage to or pastiche of or deliberate resurrection <coughs> of the strategies of modernist writing. So a concern for the fragment, a kind of wariness around the conventions of literary realism, around how far the reality effect is really capable of expressing or giving an account of what it's actually like or what it actually feels like to be alive. But then we might wonder, this relates to what Simon said earlier about the original contribution, if we can recognize experimental writing as a kind of genre in itself, with its own counter strategies and its more or less coherent rejection of literary realism, for example, then how far is it truly experimental? Um, because if something's experimental, might that not imply that it's not so easy to recognize or to situate? And that would be the same kind of worry around original. If it's truly original, can I even deal with it? Can I even see it? Um, there's another argument which would want to uh, locate experimenting with how to tell a story, with what counts as a story worth telling, with character, with plot, with address, with the materiality of the book, the space of the page, with typography and punctuation at the very heart and the very no origins of the novel as an art form, as indicated by its name, novel, meaning fresh, new, unexpected. See, for example, The Life and Opinions of Tristan Shandy, Gentleman, published in nine volumes between 1759 and 1766. Um, I'm, not, I'm saying all of this not because I feel like I know um, what I mean by the experimental or the work that I want it to do. I'm just kind of wondering about this because I have a feeling that I don't really have a handle on it or I haven't probably properly thought about it before. Um, so I'm trying to work out what I think in relation to all of this. And kind of the crux, crux of this first part of my talk is to say the way I've chosen to do this is to make a translation, <coughs> or more accurately, a retranslation. A new French to English translation of the novelist Émile Zola's Essay Manifesto, Le Roman Experimental, or The Experimental Novel, first published in 1880 and first translated into English in 1883. Zola's essay is interesting to me because it marks for the, the first time that the word experiment was deliberately used in conjunction with a kind of literary activity. Now, Zola, as I'm sure you know, was a late 19th century novelist, playwright and journalist, author of a 20-volume cycle of novels which together track the history of branches of the same family over five generations. This extraordinarily ambitious project that he mapped out, apparently, in his late 20s and uh, completed in his lifetimes. 20-volume 20, cycle of novels. Um, Zola's understanding of the experimental is very explicitly scientific. The experimental novel is based on the work of Claude Bernard, who was a French physiologist, in particular his lectures at the Collège de France, which then produced a book called, in English, Introduction to the Study of Experimental Medicine. And there's a line in Zola's essay manifesto where he says, actually, um, I'm writing this ma manifesto, but all I really need to do is just take Claude Bernard's book and replace the word doctor with the word novelist and my work would be done for me. So it's really rooted. Um, he says this is a kind of compiled text. My, my text sits on top of that, um, that work by Claude Bernard, the introduction to the study of experimental medicine. Now, interestingly, uh, for me, in that Routledge Companion to Experimental Literature, um, which is this kind of institutionalized scholarly work, Zola's essay is only mentioned twice, and only then very briefly. So there's a sense in which, however we're using the word experimental nowadays, doesn't really have much uh, relationship to this precise way that Zola was using it then, in 1880. So that was kind of prompted my curiosity to find out more about how he was using it. Um, it's precise. It was, for him, it was a two-phase process. For Zola, literature had to be based on and to come out of observation. So from the close, meticulous, detailed documentation of the world as it is. Then, like the scientist, the experimental novelist moves from observation into experimentation, where an experiment is understood as setting up the conditions 
under which new observations can be made. So an experiment for Zola is a provoked observation. Think of it like a weather simulator, perhaps. There are storms in the world, in the skies, and the novelist and the scientist together observe the storms. Um, phase one would involve describing as accurately as possible the storm's features, its mode of appearing, its mode of acting. But then, in phase two, the scientist builds a little storm basin, a weather simulator, in which to provoke or to artificially simulate the conditions for further observations. The novelist, on the other hand, makes a novel. For Zola, um, the difference is that his interest is not in the weather, in meteorology, but in psychology. So the novel is a site of simulated investigation into human behavior. Now, as I said, a translation of his essay already exists. In fact, the essay was translated almost immediately, so just three years after its publication, in 1883, by an American woman called Belle Sherman. And that translation is really easily, it's out copyright, it's easily available as a PDF online. Um, so anyone who did want to read Zola's essay could, in this accurate, serviceable um, English translation. So in that sense, a new translation is not necessary. Um, it's, my translation will be a retranslation, which actually offers me a different kind of license, a different set of possibilities in terms of what I can do compared to the Bach translations, which, uh, which were first-time translations into English, which Simon held up at the beginning. Um, and what I'd like to share with you and just kind of promote in this talk today is the idea of translation as a research method in and of itself. So the action of translation. I'm talking here in a really quite a limited sense of a work, an existing work written in one language, writing it again in another. So a translation project is its own site of inquiry, a place for me to work out what I think, while at the same time making something and making something happen. I have all these questions about what we mean when we talk about the experimental in relation to writing today, and to me they feel urgent, and ideally, ideally I'd like to resolve them quickly. But what translation does is it slows me down. It forces me to work out what I think at the pace of writing a 70-page essay again, sentence by sentence, into English. It forces me to work out what I think by way of a kind of close engagement with someone else's thinking. As a research project, a translation has its own built-in duration, which can't be accelerated, and I think this is important. Translation demands a certain uncondensable time with a work, and therefore with the questions animating that work, and with the further questions motivating and that arise from the gesture of retranslating it or translating it. Because the further point I'd like to stress and to kind of promote is the idea of translation as a way of starting a conversation with a work and having this close daily conversation with the work right now, so today, in relation to our contemporary moment, however long ago it was originally <coughs> written, and as a way of way opening up that conversation for others and to others, because the thing I make, the new translation, will in itself be discursive and conversational. It will open up Zola's essay and position to all the writing and thinking that's happened since and to the writing and thinking and art making that's happening now. A translation produces new sets of relationships. I thought perhaps I could show this in relation to a sentence. Um, so here is Zola uh, in French. Um, so he says, La médecine expérimentale qui bégaye, peut seul nous donner une idée exacte de la littérature expérimentale qui, dans l'œuf encore, n'en est même pas au bégayement. Um, and here is uh, Sherman's translation from 1883, and she writes, Experimental medicine, which but lisps as yet, can alone give us an exact idea of experimental literature, which, still being unhatched, is not even lisping. <coughs> now, uh, both sentences, it strikes me, both in English and French, are quite strange, um, especially in their use of metaphor. So experimental medicine, which but lisps as yet, the idea is that it's just setting out, you know, it's only just begun, it's in its earliest stages, we're in 1880. Um, and yet Zola's point is that only this science, albeit in its earliest stages, can give us an exact idea of what experimental literature is or could be. And experimental literature, which still being in the egg, is not even at, its, at the earliest stages stage. Okay, um, 
which but lisps as yet, so, you know, like a child or like a baby, like a toddler learning to speak. Um, and this image, to my mind, is immediately Dickensian. It makes me think of all those small children, innocent children, who lisp in Dickens' novels, and they often die, and, you know, and uh, it's a sig the lisping is a kind of signifier of their innocence. Um, lisp sounds to me very uh, late 19th century. It's also a very human um, experimental medicine here is like a small, innocent child, like a baby or a toddler who's just starting to talk. But what happens later on in the sentence? Experimental literature, on the other hand, is as yet unhatched. So a literal translation of the French would be, it's still in the egg, which I think is actually a relatively common expression in French. If something is dans le fond corps, it means it's not ready, it's in its beginnings. But if we take these metaphors literally and just seriously for a moment, then whereas experimental medicine seems, in the translation at least, to be quite clearly human, because it's lisping, it's a lisping being, experimental literature seems to be a bit more kind of fish-like or bird-like or reptile-like, because humans don't come in eggs. Experimental literature may, the line implies, come to lisp. It may well reach the lisping stage, but for the moment it's not yet even human not really human at all, and so when it gets there, experimental literature will be like a kind of human fish or human bird or human reptile or a hybrid, a kind of mutant or a monster, um, which is not an interesting thought. Now, you might think I'm reading too much into this. <laughs> you might say uh, that what I'm talking about here with eggs and lisps is just an example of bad writing, the mixed metaphors. You know, Zola's not in control of his metaphors, and the translator isn't either. Um, and I'm deliberately kind of pushing them too far. And you'd probably, you know, you'd be right. But then the question that arises, might not this not be a way of thinking about experimental writing? Experimental writing is bad writing in the sense that it's willing to break with or deviate from our expectations of good writing and to so to surprise or baffle us or provoke us into questioning or at least becoming aware of our operative norms and expectations. To translate bigie which I find hard, to, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, begiyi, which is the verb Zola uses, as to lisp, lisping, is, as I said, is a kind of choice which I think anchors the translation in its time. Perhaps a different translation choice would be to stammer, so only this still stammering experimental medicine can give us an exact idea of experimental literature, or indeed to stutter. Now, you might object and say, hold on, hang on. Um, with both of those solutions, stammering and stuttering, you lose, or at least you really get quite a lot further away from the idea of being at the beginning of something, which we have with lisping. Um, the, the beginning of life, just starting out, the idea of being in its earlier stages. Because, of course, one can stammer or stutter throughout one's life, punctually or under particular conditions, and you'd be right. But what I like about stuttering is it makes me think of an essay by philosopher Gilles Deleuze, whose title in French is Begayatil, and is part of a collection called Critique et Clinique, published in 1993. Begayé is the same verb as Zola was using. Now, the essay Begayatil was translated in 1998 into English by Daniel W. Smith and Michael A. Greco as He Stuttered. It's an essay about poetics, about how things happen in and to language by means of literature, and so not unrelated to the very idea of experimental literature. Now, I won't say anything too much more about that essay right now, because I'll be talking about it again in the second part of this talk. Um, but you might say, hold on, um, Deleuze was writing 100 years after Zola. Is there not something a bit anachronistic about forcing this link, about trying to produce this relationship between these two texts by means of this small translation decision, the decision to translate big A as to stutter. And I would say, yes, yeah, um, you're right. <laughs> but that's exactly it. I think this is what translation and retranslation can do. It messes with chronology, with the chronological <coughs> unfolding of literary history, one text after another. And it produces these new kind of knots and folds and networks and relationships. And it does this even despite itself, even despite the kind of considered intentions of the translator. It asks, what is it to read Zola's manifesto right now, today? Not a century before, but some 25 years after Deleuze. Translation and retranslation, especially perhaps, make a thing contemporary. These actions offer books for reading and rereading right now. This is the force of its gesture, I think. So I want to hold on to stuttering as a translation of Big E in this line, which I've broken up into two sentences. So the first, 
experimental medicine stuttering. Are we there? Yeah, can alone give us an exact idea of experimental literature. Okay. But what about the second line? Um, so experimental medicine stuttering can alone give us an exact idea of, of experimental literature. Experimental literature is in the egg still. It's not even stuttering. It's not even at the stuttering stage. Um, I kind of wanted to keep hold of the strangeness of this combination of a very human attribute, stuttering, because I don't think animals stutter, really. Um, and this more animal one, this idea of being inside the egg, is being unhatched. So is in the egg still. I like that as a solution, but I'm unhappy with the second part of this sentence with my translation. It's not even stuttering. It's not even at the stuttering stage. So I mucked around with it for a bit longer um, until I came up with experimental literature is in the egg still. It's not stuttering even. So an odd syntax here, but immediately I preferred it. And I think I preferred it because it sounded familiar. You know, where have I seen that end placing of even before? Oh yeah, so here. The bride stripped bare by her bachelor's even, Duchamp. The English translation of the title, La mariée mise à nu par ses célibataires, même. Also widely known, as I know you know, I'm sure you know, La Grand Verre or the Large Glass. Now, you might say, but what does Duchamp have to do with Zola's manifesto for an experimental novel? Um, perhaps nothing, except that you will remember that one synonym that's regularly offered for the experimental is avant-garde. Perhaps nothing except for a kind of similarly excited relation being proposed between science and art, so in this case, glass, the properties of glass and the laws of physics. That I know there's a chance that I might be the only one to hear these resonances that I'm getting kind of uh, invested in and caught up by in my translation. Um, but I think that's probably unlikely. I think part of the pleasure of reading comes from these resonances we hear between the text we're reading and whatever else we're currently reading or what we're being invited to read. Because, of course, our reading um, gets curated for us by our tutors, for example, or our peers, our friends, publishers, and to some extent by translators. I'm sure I'm not the only one in this room who's read Dulles on stuttering or the only one with an interest in experimental literature, which might be why you've come to this lecture, who might be interested in Dulles um, as well. So... At the same time, of course, in the translation I end up producing, there will, of course, be whole sets of further resonances for other readers over which I have no control, and that's also the point. What I would like to stress is the idea of a translation as an intervention, as a newly made version of an existing thing, newly made here and now, right now, by me, in this, my own thinking, reading, looking, making context, however long ago and whenever it was originally made, which has... And as an intervention, it has the potential to upset established and open out new frames of reference. Translation as a way of really self-interestedly pursuing my own questions, but through the writing of others, while at the same time cle clearly making something for others and in relation to others. Translation as a way of starting a new conversation about what it means to talk about or to claim to produce experimental literature. Um, and these are some of the reasons why I think it's an interesting thing to do. I called this lecture a translation manifesto. Or, to put it another way, thinking of my teenage self, why I think translation is lush in that sense of lavishly productive. End of part one. Um, you don't have to, that's true. I, just need to say, I, didn't, I didn't mean that you then have to um, applaud, but thank you. Um, so... Part two uh, is less a kind of talking through and more of a reading. Um, uh, it's a reading from a book in progress about the practice of translation, whose working title is This Little Art. Now, the title is borrowed from the correspondence of the translator uh, Helen Lowe Porter, who spent a great portion of her life, some 25 years, translating the works of Thomas Mann from German into English. A little art, she called it. So to stay with my kind of dictionary definitions from the beginning, little as in what, what, as distinct from the bigger, the more visible, the more important, the more historically recognized arts. Little as in small, smaller, relatively unimportant or trivial or <coughs> inconsequential. Little is sometimes used to express a um, affectionate attitude, like little Johnny, thinking of my lisping Dickens character from earlier, but also a more often a condescending attitude. Now, you might be aware that translators kind of struggle with these conceptions of their work all the time. 
You might be have noticed how kind of deliberately I spell out the names of the translators in that Deleuze essay, for example, you know, naming the translator because uh, making visible this work, which, um, which often goes unnoticed. And I'm using this title kind of in recognition of those conceptions of the translator's work, but also as a way of kind of protesting or parrying against it. Um, so this select section um, of the book begins inside Thomas Mann's The Magic Mountain um, and then moves out of it to talk about uh, Helen Lowe Porter and also to say something about my own translation experience and what I would like the book to do. It's a kind of inter introductory section. I'll be reading for about 20 minutes. I think it's quite always good to know how long we need to, <coughs> how much more or more of demand I'll be making your attention. Um, yeah. Okay, so... <clears throat> it's a uh, Volpurgis night in the sanatorium, and Hans Karstorp, the hero of man's novel, has been made to feel hot and reckless by the atmosphere of carnival. Across the room from him, framed in a doorway, stands Madame Shausha. She's wearing a startling gown of thin, dark silk. Was it black? Probably, or at most shot with golden brown cut with a modest little neck, round like a schoolgirl's frock, hardly so much as to show the base of her throat or the collarbones, or beneath the soft fringes of her hair, the slightly prominent bone at the back of her neck, but all the while leaving bare to the shoulder her arms. Arms so tender and so full, so cool, so amazingly white, set off against the dark silk of her frock, to such ravishing effect that it makes Hans Karstorp close his eyes and murmur within himself, Oh my God. He had once held a theory about those arms. He had thought, upon making their acquaintance for the first time, veiled under a diaphanous gauze, that their indescribable, unreasonable seductiveness was due to the gauze itself, to the illusion, as he called it. Folly, the utter, accentuated, blinding nudity of those arms, those splendid members of an infected organism, was an experience now so intoxicating compared with that earlier one as to leave our man no other recourse than again, with drooping head, to whisper soundlessly, Oh my God. Later, Agitated by the silly drama of a drawing game, he'll walk straight up to her and boldly ask for a pencil. She'll stand there in her paper party cap, looking him up and down. I, she'll ask. Perhaps I have. Let me see. Eventually, she'll fetch one up from deep within her leather bag, a little silver pencil, slender and fragile, scarcely meant for use. Voila, she'll say, holding it up by its end in front of him, between thumb and forefinger, lightly turning it to and fro. Because she won't quite hand it to him, because she'll give it to him and withhold it, he'll take it, so to speak, without receiving it. That is, he'll hold out his hand, ready to gasp, grasp the delicate thing, but without actually touching it. C'est à visser, tu sais She'll say, you have to unscrew it. And with heads bent over it together, she'll show him the mechanism. It's quite ordinary. The little needle of hard, probably worthless lead coming down as one loosened the screw. She'll speak to him in French and he'll follow. It will be the first time they address each other, a lover's deep thrill at exchanging his first remarks. He'll speak French uneasily, feeling for the sense a little further on, she will command, more impersonally now, Parlez allemand, s'il vous plaît. Speak in German, if you please. And in the copy of the book I have splayed next to me as I write this, Hans Karstorp replies in English. Of course he does. The German of their conversation, the German of the whole book, of the novel I'm reading in Helen Lowe Porter's translation, has to be rendered in English. This is the pact of translation. It's the constraint that the translator labours under. A novel set high in the Swiss Alps, 
one of Germany's most formative contributions to modern European literature, so it says on the back cover of my edition. And here they are speaking in English. The descriptions are in English. The action is in English. The whole thing unfolds mostly in English. And we go with it. Of course we do, just as we tend to go with it. When we read or watch or hear any kind of fiction, we agree to suspend our disbelief. We willingly accept the terms because, gladly in fact, because with no German, I look at my bookshelves, also no Italian, no Norwegian, no Japanese, no Spanish, no Dutch, no Korean. We know that in translation, this is how the writing comes, with a new fiction to supplement everything that's going on in its own. An unassuming young man called Hans Karstorp travels from his native city of Hamburg to Davistor. When he arrives at the small station, he's surprised to hear his cousin's familiar voice greeting him. Hello, Joachim says, in early 20th century British English. There you are. Lila and Lenu whisper and bicker together as they play with their dolls on the steps of Don Achille's apartment building. They speak in English in the novels of Elena Ferranti. Their setting is an impoverished quarter of Naples. Emma Bovary sighs to herself in English as she reclines on a small sofa to read romantic novels in French. What exactly is the translator asking us to believe? Not that the prose should be, or that the characters should all be speaking in English, that this is wholly normal. It's more that she's asked, she wants us not to let it matter too much if it is and if they do. When it comes to reading in translation, we don't normally stop to query the language the writing is written in. We accept that it's ours and that this is how and why we can read it. We're so inclined to accept this, no doubt because our invested acceptance, our willingness not to query, is of the same order as our willingness to believe in the grey water lake noted from the train, the drama of the doll dropped through the grating, or the sofa's slightly shabby brocade. Yes, but then we come across a scene like this one, marking the midway point of the Magic Mountain. This strange, bilingual, now made trilingual scene. Here the characters are speaking in more than one language. They are moving from one language into another, and what's more, they're speaking about the languages they're speaking in. They're pointing, self-consciously, to their choice of one language over another. If Hans Karstorp is prepared to address Claudia Schauscher so hesitantly and uneasily in French, it's because, as he says, it's for him la langue d'amour, it's the language of love. Suddenly, the pact of translation is exposed. Suddenly, we see it for all of its funny fictionality. So this was never in English then. This was always in German. German as distinct from the French that the characters are now speaking or this was always supposed to have been in German, and we did know this implicitly, even as we received the novel in English. And so it dawns on us that all of the long sections written here in French in this exchange, sections which appear in French on the page, even in my English translation, must have been left untranslated. These are untouched, transcribed Thomas Mann. The translator has lifted them directly from the German edition in which they also appear and is hoping for enough familiarity on the part of her readers that they'll be able to follow them, or if not that, then enough indulgence on the part of her readers that they'll be prepared to skim over them. What else was she going to do? A note. Yes, she might have translated the French sections into English and written a note, making us all nod as we read, flagging up from the bottom of the page that what we're about to read or have just read is or was said in French, the rest of it in German, and here is all of it in English. Or italics. She might have used italics or a new font maybe, like in the dragon training book that I'm reading aloud to my sons at bedtime. When the hero speaks Dragonese, or when the dragons speak to each other in their own peculiar, cold, deep-sea language, their words appear written out in English, but printed on the page in something like Adobe Gothic, which makes for a conundrum. Should I assume a dragon accent when I read the dragon bits aloud? You know, like the villains once did in the movie. Or should I just tell them, announcing as I read, right, so listen, sons, you'll hear this bit in English, but since it's a dragon who's speaking, and speaking in a language that no human bar the hero is supposed to understand, what you'll truly be hearing, according to the logic of the book, is a kind of live, instant translation, like that scene in the Bible, the New Testament, when God speaks, and the miracle of it is that everyone, all the disciples, and everyone all around, hears his words as spoken 
directly and simulated, simultaneously to them in their own language with no delay and no interval, speech multiplied and diversified all at once but without difference, without it actually making any difference. Or like the moments in Elena Ferranti's novels when her characters abruptly switch from Italian into dialect and back again, and rather than producing the passages of dialect on the page, Ferranti asks us to imagine them. Even the in the original, so I learned from an interview with Anne Goldstein, her translator, even in the original, Ferranti asks us to imagine the switch, to hear this sudden change in cadence, in vowel sounds, in familiarity, in violence and urgency from Italian into dialect, and to hear what this means, but without actually hearing it. And all of this recalling the writer's conundrum that Gilles Deleuze sets up in the beginning of his essay, He Stuttered, co-translated by Daniel W. Smith and Michael A. Greco. So let's say you're a writer, writes Deleuze, and you want your character to stutter. What do you do? Either you write the stutter out, you show the stuttering on the page, you perform it without announcing it. No, he said. Or you announce it, you indicate it, but without performing it. No, he stuttered. What else are you going to do? In fact, it soon becomes clear that I don't need to do anything. My kids, they don't need me to keep reminding them of the dragon difference. They've got it. They get it. This is what books do, Mum. It's what, or at least this is what good books do. They make us hear the different voices. They make us believe that they're written in different languages, in different orders of language, here competing against one another, even when they appear to be written in just one. And they're right. Of course they're right. And what they're saying is sort of on the way towards what Deleuze is saying, too, about Kafka and about Beckett, and about what he sees as a third option available to the writer, which would be neither to perform it nor to announce it, but to make language itself stutter, to make the whole linguistic system stutter and stammer, to make stuttering manifest at every level of the writing, from the syntax to the tent schemes to the frantic whisking of a giant beetle's legs as it lies helpless on its back on the living room floor. I'm the one who wants them to pause on the threshold of believing for a moment and to think for a bit longer about how this translation pact works. The translator as fiction writer, as always dealing in, as necessarily invested in fabricating her own further fiction and working to make it hold, or indeed strategically managing the moments when she'll allow its fabric to provisionally rupture. And it occurs to me that if I keep returning to this scene in the Magic Mountain, to this extraordinary scene of difference and desire as played out by the offsetting of one powerful national language against the other, and with all of it happening for me in a third, is because I want us all to pause and to register for a moment, and to register not just like a box we might tick unthinkingly or casually on some web page or other. Yes, okay, cookies. Yes, okay, translation. We've got it, we get it, we accept your terms. But to stop and to properly register with a little gasp in the course of reading, that if the exchanges in French are still Thomas Mann's, lifted, intact, and unaltered from the German text in which they were once embedded, what this means, what this must mean, is that everything else in the English edition that's framing them, that's to say, all of the sentences that I transcribed and repunctuated above, the thin, dark silk, black, though possibly shot with golden brown, the soft fringes of her hair, the slightly prominent bone, the amazingly white arms, the full and the cool, the one slender pencil, the mechanism with its hard little needle of thread, were handled by Helen Lowe Porter. In translation, we received them twice written, the second time by her. In 1925, the publisher Alfred A. Knopf acquired the exclusive translation rights to publish Thomas Mann's works in English. The translator he would eventually commission was Helen Tracy Lowe Porter, a friend of the author's and an admirer of his work. Then aged 44, she would work on the translations of Mann's works for the next 25 years, stopping only in her late 60s, partly because of ill health, partly to pursue or resume her own literary projects, poems, a play. Lowe Porter's translations would be extraordinarily successful, fast-selling, popular with the reading public, and the means by which Thomas Mann would be introduced into the English-speaking world. New versions of Mann's works have appeared in the years since the publisher's claim on the rights expired, but Lowe Porter's work is still everywhere in print. 
I read The Magic Mountain in Lo Porter's translation, a vintage classics edition with a cover photo like a stage set built from three separate flats of alpine scene. It's a bit battered, the cover is creased. One long crease runs up the front of it like a lifeline, skirting past the cluster of bright buildings in the foreground, through and over the hill of black forest behind them, then scaling the greyer, more distant mountain peak beyond it before making its way up and out into the white sky and off the toppermost edge of my book. I've handled it a lot. Man's novel was one of the books I read in preparation for translating Roland Barthes' How to Live Together, the lecture course on small communities that he delivered at the Collège de France between January and May 1977. The Magic Mountain, with its structured sanatorium living, was a key text for Barthes, one of a small selection of tutor texts, or texte d'appui, as he calls them, that he draws on in the course. Texte d'appui, supporting texts, the texts that brace us, that we lean on, testing them to see if they'll support our weight, the texts that we always seem to be in conversation with, whether directly or indirectly, the texts that enable us to say or to write anything at all. Every discourse, says but, is generated and sustained by its own more or less idiosyncratic selection. Bart read The Magic Mountain in Maurice Bette's translation, and I'm told that in French, the scene with the pencil is this most extraordinary thing. No footnotes, no italics. The French exchanges appear here in French. Of course they do, surrounded by what's now the French of the novel. And yet, rather than the difference of the lifted French being lost, it's somehow made more striking. Hans Castorp speaks the language uneasily, feeling for the sense. Madame Chaucha speaks it with this peculiar Russian inflection. Each character speaks the language differently, and their performance of, performances of it are different again from the French that the translator has elaborated or invented for man's prose. I think of all the small contacts a translation makes, putting one book literally in touch with another, their faces smashed against each other in a pile on my desk or with less pressure, the one leaning on the other, supporting the other on my shelves. Contacts that make pathways. There's a character in Man's novel, a Mexican woman called Tous les Deux. She's called Tous les Deux in the German as well. One of her sons is dying of tuberculosis, and now the other, who'd come to the sanatorium to visit his brother, has fallen ill too. Tous les Deux, both of them. Can you believe it? Both of them. She wanders the corridors of the novel, wondering at it, despairing at it, muttering it to herself. Tous les deux. What great sad sadness. Hence her nickname. A nickname that passes in untouched from the German into the French translation in 1931 and following a different route makes its way intact into the English translation in 1927 that's picked up and considered by Roland Barthes at the close of a lecture on names in 1977 before eventually becoming the subject of an email exchange between Bart's English translator and her copy editor in the spring of 2013. Should we leave it in French, this name? In this English translation of Bart's lecture notes, should we leave the nickname in French as Le Porte did, making briefly visible this small channel between her work and our own? In November 1995, the scholar Tim Buck published an article in the Times Literary Supplement. It would be a devastating and in the small circles of translation scholarship, and now notorious, notorious assessment of the quality of Lo Porter's translations, comparing a random sample of passages of Mann's novel Buddenbrooks in the original German with the English, Buck lists mistake after mistake after mistake, errors of lexis, syntax and tense, unexplained omissions, unjustified rephrasings. Clearly, says Buck, Lo Porter was a bungling amateur with a strikingly inadequate knowledge of German. Worse, worse than that, she was an amateur with an inflated sense of her own importance, either wholly ignorant of or unwilling to acknowledge her own limitations. Lo Porter was not man's chosen translator, Buck tells us. He wanted someone with better German. And not only was her German poor, but just look at her English, ungainly, unidiomatic, at times incomprehensible. She pressed 
for the honour of translating man, not relenting until the prize of being man's translator was hers. She was hungry for the cultural capital that Buck is sure, that she felt sure, would come her way via the long-term association of her name with his. How could this have happened? Extrapolating the main complaint of the article seems to come down to this. Was no one checking? Was no one in charge? How is it possible that the English Thomas Mann, and by implication, the great machine of literary history, should have been determined in this way, so contingently, so unthinkingly, by the vagaries of one woman's writing desire? Following the article's publication came a rush of letters to the editor. Lawrence Venuti wrote in, strongly objecting to the typical <coughs> academic condescension toward translators and translation he detected in Buck's article, and tried building a defense of Low Porter's mistakes out of the general point that standards for what makes a good translation change. There exists a tacit aesthetics of translation, he wrote, one that, like all aesthetic traditions, is necessarily of its time. David Luke, whose 1988 translation of Man's Death in Venice, Buck has, had praised as a model translation, faithful to the original and yet fluent, replied with evidence of still more mistakes and still more condescension. You can't blame Man's complex sentences for this, he argued, or changing standards of accuracy. No, what we're dealing with here is failure. Just look at her schoolboy howlers. Bernuti came back with another letter. Luke replied again. Eventually, Lo Porter's daughters wrote in with an account of how their late mother conceived of her work. A perverse pleasure, she called it, offering its own experience of creative authorship. Look to the whole, the daughters asked, and note the promise she lived by. She would not send her translations to the publisher until she felt as though she had written the books herself. Amateur translator, maker of holes, would-be writer who refuses to let go of her translations until she feels she has written the books herself. These are the positions I'm interested in. These are the headings I want to try to think and sing out from under, because there are pleasures in translation, perverse ones and unlikely ones. There is amateurishness, not knowing, and improvisation. There's often a strong writing desire and great conscious audacity, along with and complicating the more familiar humility, service, and willing apprenticeship. There's the making of a thing, a new volume in a wholly new context with very different materials. And there is this close identification, this deep tugging embroilment with the sentence that she's working on. Then the great sequence of sentences that the translator is not wrong or at least I can't see how she is exactly wrong in no way straightforwardly wrong to feel that she is writing herself thank you for your attention <laughs>
Simon, could you do the pointing? Because yeah, I'm not well aware of who's. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm just thinking about the thing that you should. I can't remember it now. Um, you should try and say the most important things in a language one does not understand. Right. And whether, in terms of being a translator, that kind of struggle of knowing you're never going to. There's never going to be. <coughs> A translation in a literal yeah. sense mm -hmm. is is that the problematic space where the, the mistakes happen? Is mm -hmm. that the is that the kind of creative space where your work becomes, you know, the, the translation aspect of your work becomes a creative piece of writing? I think translation, I would say, is always a creative piece of writing. And um, one thing I say when I'm working with students who are doing translations for the first time, I'm kind of not as you might have guess from my emphasis on amateur translator, I'm not really interested. I don't think it's really true, this idea that one must acquire kind of um, uh, extraordinary expertise, uh, adult, you know, in both languages, both cultures, both before translation can begin. Um, I think translation is a writing practice, um, and so for me, in any case, and, and, and its interest is in how, like the, the pressure that French puts on English by trying to write sentences that originated in French in English. Um, so when this question of mistakes, you know, I, I hope there was a kind of defense of Low Porter there. I mean, I'm, I'm far more interested in the fact that my experience of um, what she made, this hole in this transcript, the, the Magic Mountain, was this experience for me, whether or not at the level of um, sentence by sentence comparison that works as a kind of accurate translation, there's still this. Uh, I think that's yeah. what I was about to right. The right, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of thinking back to this question of experimental writing, like if you would just simply just take French syntax and just make English work according to the laws of French, in French syntax, then you'd make English do something a bit weird. You know, there is a spe certainly there are lots of things that can happen um, just by putting one language into contact with another. And that, I think that's the space you're, you're thinking of. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that space of working it out, you know, mucking around with a sentence again and again until you, you feel like it's doing something. Um, yeah. Um, can I go back to lisping and stuttering? Oh. Um, my French isn't that good, but yeah. I just wondered if you considered babble as, or babbling, right. mm -hmm. maybe what the roots are there. Mm -hmm. And also I'm thinking of Gustava. Right, okay. And babbling as it, allowing you to get back to childhood, but also incorporating yeah. psychosis, perhaps. Right. So, <laughs> in the yeah, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, I immediately, because it's Begier, yeah. and because it's Begier-Til, that for me was just uh, just an interesting thing that I could make the translation do. Um, but yeah, you, no, absolutely, you're right. And that would be an example of what I'm saying, is the resonances of babble would be would then... Would then point the translation or open up, up the translation and set the references into a slightly different space, mm -hmm. which could be really interesting too. I mean, I'm, yeah, uh, there's lots of things. As a retranslation, as I said, there's a different kind of license and freedom. So the moment my experimental novelist is a she throughout, you know, why not the pronoun choice? What does that do? What does that do to the whole thing? And then to literary history if, if then the, you know, the origins of, uh, well, I don't think Zola's making a claim about the origin, you know, locating the origins of, of experimental literature in the sense that we understand it, but in the precise sense that he has understanding. I think, yeah, what happens if she's a she? Mm. And then what? Yeah. But thank you. No, I haven't. I haven't thought about it. Yeah. Uh, really, just extending on from what you were just saying. Um, how do you deal with the conflict between? Something subjective, something subjective, like trying to say what you think the person meant, to something where you're trying to literally say what they said, mm -hmm. such as what you were just saying with yeah. with the the, the the metaphor of lisping and yeah. so on. Yeah. Uh, if you was trying to sort of say subjectively what you thought they meant, you might say that you know uh, medical experimental um, whatever literature yeah. is in its infancy, yeah. whereas. Um, experimental literature is yeah. is in, not even in yeah. conception, you know, yeah. or just in conception, yeah. Yeah? yeah, something like that, which maybe puts across the meaning of what it seems she was trying to say, mm. was trying to say, but completely lists uh, loses all of the what he actually said. Yeah, yeah. Um, how do you deal with that conflict? You 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 
list them both and say what he said and what, what you think it means as a footnote, or do you go for what you think is the meaning, because this thing about whether it lisps or not is a bit stupid metaphor. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, how, how would you well, do that? Well, I think what you're describing is like, what do you do? Is just that kind of, that's the daily work of a translator, kind of thinking, what do I do here? I think in relation to the question, um, there are, you know, theoreticians of translation come up with kind of positions that you can take, that the idea of, you know, extrapolating meaning, deciding what something means rather than attending to that, the literal wording um, would be a kind of violence done to the literal wording. It's more, more interesting to um, work, work word for word with what was actually said. That would be, you know, a position one could, could adopt as a kind of, um, yeah, uh, uh, a political position or aesthetic position in relation to translation. I think what actually happens in your life is that with each uh, sentence and bit of sentence, you are asking yourself the question again, what do I do here? What do I do here? What do I do here? And you're adjusting your solutions um, uh, in relation to what, you're, what you, you've got uh, in front of you. So a translation is this um, record or document of a billion micro decisions of the order that you're describing. And that's kind of like what we want to say, like, look at, the, look at it, you know. It's, uh, uh, and I don't think there is, a, there is a rule in relation to that. It would depend entirely on the sentence, depend what, you, what you've done with the sentence further higher up and lower down, and 300 pages later. Yeah, hence the idea of working, the idea of translation is making a volume, making a thing. Um, because with the Bach translation, you know, this uh, was quite a big thing. <laughs> um, so a decision, a decision made here, uh, you know, is is related and you know to a decision decision made here, and it's like that kind of management of this, of this 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 object, really. Um, yeah. So I think you pointed out exactly what's complicated and interesting and fascinating about it. Yeah. There's NASA there. <coughs> uh, thank you very much. I was I was thinking of the egg, and right. I like the emergent sense of things. I think it comes. I don't know if I'm asking a question. If this is a comment, but the idea of the unformedness yeah. of an experimental literature, mm. I think, is really attractive to me. And I think of Bataille. Right, all oh, right, eggs, yeah. And true, I yeah. thought of, uh, I think it's Deleuze, but did he, was he the guy who talked about the homelet? Was he punning off of man and omelet as this no, but kind is of that, um, scrambled? That's interesting. Is it, is it Demi Dye talks about the homelet? No, it, because it must I, be Demi yeah, Dye, that's right. It, yeah, I think so, yeah. It's interesting because Bart has a thing about omelet. I'm just reminding me now. Yeah, about her. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, and just the the sense that we're not going to recognize. Uh, well, I guess the way in which experimental literature pushes against um, received ideas of order, mm. I, mm. I suppose, and the egg is this lovely image of the disordered <coughs> or uh, emergent self, and I, I love the way you're talking about the translated. Text as a kind of always emerging thing. Yeah, I think. Sense. Or I mean, yeah. and how do you deal with like the work after it's done? Do you know what I mean? I think. Like, is that Barth's yeah. translation now concrete for you? Or, not at all. Right? No, not at all. No. I <coughs> yeah. think that's the thing that the idea. Of, I suppose just a kind of call, a call to translate, as it were, to say to say this can be a site of in, a site of inquiry. Imagine if you were really interested in a text. You know, we read a lot of the way I got into. Um, Translation really is I was doing an English literature degree and I found that I was reading a lot of French theory at the time, yep. mid to late 1990s, and I was reading a lot of it in translation. So I thought, well, what would happen if I go read the French, not having particularly um, expert level of French at the time, but you know, to take a text that you're really interested in and you've read in translation and go to the original and just work at it with a dictionary and with Google Translate and with, and with, your, you know, with all of these tools and it becomes this kind of... Um, site of inquiry um, or, and a place of things happening um, and it, it happens through writing because you're writing it again as, you know and the way writing as I'm sure you know is this productive process in itself you know writing produces writing produces ideas produces thinking so for me the translations um, I I really uh, when I was in my deep anxieties around these especially around the time of their publication and they're being reviewed and stuff I would console myself provisionally by the idea that these are lecture notes yeah. So they have this provisional quality already. For Bart, they were never meant to be books. Right. They were notes for a lecture performance, um, which were then published posthumously. So uh, the, the sort of the document that I was working from had a provisional status, which made me feel better about what I feel to be the wholly provisional status of my 
translation, but I know that too is a fiction because in low water, you know, when she says the soft fringes of her hair, I think that's such an extraordinary line, and I fix it and I hold it like it's a like it's a definite thing. And someone who is into Bach and wants to read this beautiful course, you know, they would take a line that I've handled and they would do the same thing um, if yeah. they liked it. You know, so yeah. It's complicated. It really is. Yeah. I think I've got a two-part question. Um, if I'm understanding you correctly, you're talking about um, something of an interval and a pause and a hesitation in taking in the translation's framing, or the translator's framing, as a creative act <coughs> in addition to the translation itself. So there's a kind of this creative authorship Right. But I was also thinking about what you were saying about um, Deleuze, because um, in the formula, which is also part from the critical and clinical essays, he um, takes this phrase, and my French is appalling, <laughs> um, je n'ai de trop, je n'ai et pas assez, il n'est banque un, meaning I am one short. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered whether there was this equilibrium between yourself and this hesitation, this interval to commit to its absolute meaning and categorization to Deleuze's interpretation of, I would prefer not, right. and I am one short. Um, I think of a, the second part of that, as I was saying, is complicated in the sense that I think also the translator has to and I don't have the luxury of not committing because I do need to mm. make a decision. Even if in my head those decisions could always be otherwise. And if I do, if I do go back to my translations, I want to quote Bart, you know, in English because it's an English whatever. Um, then I will always be tinkering with them, working over them again. But there is a kind of uh, it is a decision making process too. So I don't. I think part of yeah, and it's making something. It's making a thing that has a kind of structure and robustness to come back to that world. Um, so I don't think it would be about, I would prefer not to. I don't think that, that a translator can inhabit that space um, by the nature of having to, the pact of translation to say, here it is, I've made it for you. Um, here it is, even though, here it is, here is the thing itself. We all know it's not the thing itself, but let's pretend it's the thing itself. You know, that's the kind that's of That's what I was thinking about, that, the I am one short. Um, it is, but one short. Um, it's um, one short of complete accuracy. Um, and I, just from, yeah, I was thinking of it in those sort of terms, really. I think it's interesting to think of translations as these kind of virtual versions, so yeah. simulated versions, possible versions of uh, work in the world. So, but in English, but in Spanish, but in Norwegian, but in um, all of them. So, in a sense, yeah, there's a long history of a discourse around translations lacking, it's necessarily inadequate, and um, but also it has this kind of supplementary function. Um, and this, I know that's why I was talking about the fiction in Lo Porter's translation. This kind of fiction, you know, we read these books. They're set in France. They've got French character names, um, but they're all speaking in English, and it's a, that's a fiction. And we go with it, and it's a supplementary fiction that's not present in the French novel itself. So it's got this added layer, and that, you know, you could pursue that and say supplement Derrida, supplement. You know, that's the, yeah. the logic of the supplement. They go somewhere with that. If you, you know, if you. If you if you were so inclined. Um, yeah. Uh, but I think in terms of framing the project, for me, like, this translation, this was the first big translation I did uh, uh, on my own, on, on, under my own steam. Um, and I saw it as a, as a kind of private art project, <laughs> really. I wanted to take... I wanted to take this course about the novel because of my desire and fascination for the novel, um, which I'm slowly kind of working towards as an art form, very slowly. Um, and I wanted to take my, the way of taking the course, being a student of the course, the most laborious way of taking it was to translate it word for word. And, um, I have this own kind of conception of how, what I was doing, but of course the, you know, the trans, that's how I was thinking of the translation practice. But nobody cares particularly. You know, they would care if I frame it in this way and say, yeah. this was my art practice and this is its material object. This is its outcome. Yeah. Um, but it was published by a press. You know, who, who's not framing in that way at all. It's not. Um, so I do think framing, the framing of, a, of an activity, of course, it's, you know, it's hugely important. And I think just to end on that, like in a way, the project of the book is to try and reframe how we think about that activity and just say, look, you know, look at 
Look at how she, look at these words, she handled them, she touched them, low porter, she touched them, all of them, every single one. You know, just wonder at that for a little while. That's <laughs> fine, yeah. Um, thank you, um, that was fantastic. Um, I've just a really sort of dumb question, really, but is there any prospect that this book, will, this little art, will become translated? And that someone will present a German <laughs> lecture about their translation yeah. of your... Well, I'm really, I feel really lucky and really uh, happy at the moment. I'm just, so I was going to come out with a small press called Fitzcarraldo Editions um, in 2017. And I got uh, um, an email from the editor the other day saying, so ideally, for the French version, where would you like it to appear? That's such a brilliant email. I've never had like that in my life. Um, great. I was like, so? I don't know. Gallimard? Yeah, well, that's a good while. I don't know. Um, so, yes, I, you know, wow. uh, well, he, he's, it would be brilliant. I'd love it to be translated. I, I mean, I'd especially like it to be translated into French for obvious reasons. But then then you've got a whole problem with that whole section with the low porter. Like, what would you do with that? Because, yeah, well, that's Would you translate it yourself? Would you translate it doesn't it? Yeah. Would you translate it yourself? Um, I think I'd like to translate it. I'd like someone to translate it and then for me to come in and say, no. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's how I'd like to do it. That's my plan. There's <laughs> a question at the back. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this, this may be a little bit of a curveball because um, for me in my practice, I'm not really a, a writer and I don't speak any other languages. Yeah. So um, the, the uh, idea of me translating something, would it would probably turn out pretty bad. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I was just thinking about the um, the quote that you spoke about to do with experimental writing at yeah. the beginning, um, and how the, anything that's experimental is, is kind of unfinished in a way, and it's a, it's a process um, towards a final idea. Um, and uh, I was just wondering whether you thought that that um, idea of the experimental could be lifted from kind of experimental writing and just kind of to do with ex experimental in general and whether whether that could be applied to, to other other things and, and also um, whether whether you feel that that process should be documented or, or whether it should just be, I don't, I don't know, I'm just open. There's a big, there's a big kind yeah. of how to have a practice kind of questions. I think, I think um, what I like about translation as a sort of site of inquiry is it has all of these parameters <coughs> set up. So it's often, I'm a writer, I'm not writing, working with a blank page, it's already written, it's already decided for me what there is to write. My task is to work out how to write it, the questions we talked about earlier. Um, then, and I think I like the idea of um, the experiment being this kind of, sense in which you set up the parameters for yourself, um, the conditions under which you might observe something happening. You know, that might be a really interesting way to think about it in all different kind of, in relation to all different kinds of practices and domains. Then the question of it, um, how far you document that process or whether the process is itself interesting or whether the outcome is more interesting and then you can then like make the process and how you got there disappear. I think those are decisions for like every everyday artist decisions which I think people are, you know, you, you know, depending on the project and depending on the, um, on what's being investigated. But I, yeah, I think it's about, you know, I like, I, yeah, it seems to me true when I'm observing the artists I work with about those for whom do have a sense of the parameters of their thinking, making space, as in creating up a kind of scene in which stuff can be thought about and investigated, um, seem to me to be the ones who have a healthier practice than those who don't have parameters, <laughs> or do you, you know, I mean, that's kind of an obvious thing to say, maybe. But, yeah. um, translation would be an extreme example of a very, a whole load of decisions having been made for you, in a sense. Mm. There are no decisions, except for all of the gazillion of decisions you then need to make. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, somebody who didn't have parameters couldn't be experimental, could they? Mm. In order to be outside the parameters, X. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to know what the parameters are to go outside them. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, just wondering, do you ever work collaboratively when translating something? And if not, do you ever worry that your own personal experience and your own interpretation of what something means when it is translated leads it to bias? Um, I have worked that actually uh, on the, the, the Foucault translation um, where there I was working with someone who had expertise about the text we were translating but didn't really have so he doesn't have
um, experience of writing in English, and I was coming in as the person who was writing in English. But what was interesting about that was it was very. It soon became impossible for him just to say, "I'll tell you what this means," and you write it. You know, it was also in order to translate it, I had to know what it meant. So it was like that inquiry again. I had to kind of go into the text and work out what was happening in order to translate it. So the collaboration that actually it kind of we 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 managed it, it was quite a short text, but um, it sort of failed in the sense that um, we both it's almost like we had to translate it twice almost for that to work. Him he to translate it for me to translate it. Um, that's quite yeah. I could talk for a length of the complication of that particular. Well, it's still a good friend, but um, it made me came out of that making me think actually um, translation. The next translation I do, I'd like to do on my own. Yeah, and then I think inevitably, then I do on my own with my own aesthetic, my own sense of um, my own understanding of the text, my own. So of course there would be that bias that you mentioned. I think that's something that I'm interested in in just in just recognizing. We have this idea of the translation like this myth of the translation like a kind of window onto the thing itself, when it was made by a living, breathing, gendered, you know, the gender was a, was a huge part of how Low Porter's translations were received, being um, made by a bo another body working at a different time. So inevitably there would be that um, bias of understanding. And that's why we have retranslations, because things seem dated and they seem like skewed to their time or caught up with their concerns. Um, the concerns of that moment and they need to be translated freshly to address the concerns of our present moment. So I think bias is something I kind of cool with to the extent that I know it's inevitable, but that doesn't stop me from wanting to, what translation does, is wanting to attend as closely as possible to the text itself and, and uh, you know, um, respond to it, be in conversation with it, make it work upon me, you know, not just decide for myself what I think, let it, let it decide for me what I might think. Does that make sense? That kind of two-way process being of acting on something but also being acted upon by something. Yeah. Okay, is that everyone? I think there's one last one. One last yeah. question. Yeah. yeah. Has translation expressed inquiry received as you would like? Um that's a big question. Um 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 yeah, well, I think what translation does is it makes you, um, it's a kind of lesson in your own language. Because, especially translating someone like Roland Barthes, who uses um, terms so precisely, but if you look in the dictionary of um, the way he used, say you have sort of six different definitions for a word, and he'll be using the sixth, always the one right at the bottom, the most kind of right at the edge of its usual usage. The, the next translation, translation I do, I'm like, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and then um, I think having to find the equivalent, then I do all my own, with my own aesthetic, my own important sense of my own understanding, it is like my own. So, of course, there would be a bias. Yeah, I think that's something that I'm interested in. I would just recognize that we have this idea of translation, but it forces the myth of the translation by habits when you write it. I would try to make that sound a bit more like how I think it's made by what another little translation it didn't you know, that's terrible. That's the opposite of what I should be doing. My sense, and that's why I'm learning how he makes them seem dangerous. They seem to be like skewed to their time or caught up with their concerns. The concerns of that moment need to be translated freshly to address the concerns of the present moment. So, I think bias is something I kind of cool with to the extent that I know it's inevitable, but that doesn't stop me from wanting to what translation does wanting to attend as closely as possible to the text itself and, and uh, you know, um, respond to it, be in conversation with it, make it work upon me, and you know, not just decide for myself what I think, let it, let it decide for me what I might think. Does that make sense? That kind of two-way process, being of acting on something, but also being acting on something. Yeah. Okay. Is that everyone? I think there's one last one. One last question. Yeah. yeah. Has translate from French changed the way you conceive of the English language? Um. That's a big question. Um. Um. um yeah, well, I think what translation does is it makes you, um, it's a kind of lesson in your own language. Because, especially translating someone like Roland Barthes, who uses um, terms so precisely that if you look in the dictionary of um, the way he used, say you have sort of 
six different definitions for a word, and he'll be using the sixth, always the one right, <laughs> the most kind of right at the edge of its usual usage, but linked to its etymology in some way. So, it's like, so um, having to find equivalent terms or terms that might do the same work, in, you know, caused me to expand my vocabulary. So it is like an apprenticeship in my own language, and I think, yeah, definitely a kind of learning experience in English. And I would argue another reason for why it's interesting to do is it because it forces you out of your habits as a writer. As a, you know, we have our tics, we have our sense of what makes a good sentence. You're translating someone else's aesthetic of the sentence. It's having, to, you know, it's forcing you to, to. I would try to make that sound a bit more like how I think a sentence should go, and then look at the translation. And go, no, that's you know, that's terrible. That's, you know, that's the opposite of what I should be doing. I need to make my sentence. I need to learn from how he makes a sentence, especially because he's such an extraordinary sentence writer. So, yeah, it, it's made me learn that more, a lot more about my own language, I'd say, yeah. <coughs> Kate Riggs, that was lush. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs>